stewarding responsible growth, building a viable digital infrastructure ecosystem. I'm joined by my esteemed panelists, who I'll just hand over quickly to give a brief introduction to you my panelists to kick us off. Good afternoon, everyone. Hans Peter Matic here from uh, Infra Partners. Um, we are um, a business um, building prefabricated data centers trying to bring um, infrastructure, uh, deployed infrastructure in half the time and uh, at comparable cost. Hi, um, I'm Dev. Um, I represent ESI, a large integrated uh, asset manager and developer in Asia, managing about $160 billion of assets. Uh, developing about 600 megawatts of data centers across uh, eight different countries or eight different markets right now. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve Hall. I'm the CEO of Crown Hosting, which is a joint venture between our data centers and the UK government. And our purpose is to try and bring the UK government uh, to a modern, sustainable data center environment. Hi, I'm Chester Reed. I'm the CEO of Young and Group. We're active globally in data center operator and developer, active in, in North America and the NA. Great, thank you. So we've got quite a broad and ambitious title, um, but I'd like to sort of try and break that down into the, the what, what will that ecosystem look like in the future that we're we need to deliver, and then the question of how it's going to be delivered in a responsible way. So, Mihalis, we, we've heard a lot about trends like generative AI, um, and, and we've heard a little bit less about Edge, this conference for a change. We'd be keen to, to get your view in, in the trends you think that will be shaping the digital infrastructure ecosystem in the, in the midterm. So, so um, from our point of view, so we're currently working on both edge deployments and AI machine learning deployments currently. Um, from what we've heard of the group, the various panels, um, um, we've heard about um, workloads as a start of the other on, on both of these use cases. Um, it's a thing. Um, I think the industry was trying to understand, um, you know, how the revenues can be generated and the value of that, and you saw that um, ChatGPT and the various other. Um, kind of AI um, solutions out there that they can pace like hundreds of millions of um, customers globally. So um, it's happening, it's here now. The, the, the one thing that people need to appreciate that from um, the request for workload until you actually have that workload live in the location, we're looking at anywhere between 18 months to 36 months. So if you hear, we're hearing about specific workloads in a, in a location right now, it means that we're already too late um, because you know we, the workloads won't wait three years for you to sell them. So eventually, what's going to happen is um, those workloads will land themselves wherever there is um, availability. Now the big um, challenge is that those new workloads, both on edge and also on AI, the um, these workloads. Are very different from what we've been experiencing so far, so they're not kind of fine to any KW anymore. They're like you know, 50 KW per hour, 100 KW per hour, um, 200 KW per hour. Um, it's not just the physical um, power requirement, it's the weight requirement, so it's completely new, um, and we need to get to those solutions um, very quickly. At the same time, there's a question on the cost side of things. Um, so um, the um, Consumers, they expect a lot more for them, and they're not willing to pay more for that service. So there is a, a point where you know people are willing to pay less and less and less, and you need to be delivering more and more and more. And um, I think we're reaching that point very, very, very quickly. So um, as a wrap up, I think as an industry, we need to start thinking to um, deliver more um, with less, and the only way we can do that is by changing what we've been doing for the last 20 years. So we need to think about new concepts, new ideas, new ways of delivery, um, and kind of um, reinvent themselves. So, so they have obviously, as a, as a developer uh, of hyperscale data centers, you're interacting with the groups that are at the forefront of some of these trends. Are you seeing 
their requests and requirements change now? Or are you anticipating anything? Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, so, so, so as a developer, we um, have about 2,400 people on the ground across nine different countries in Asia Pacific, and, and that's more the development business, not, not necessarily data center business. Um, but as we sort of talk to uh, customers, we are realizing a couple of things. One is, you know, they need campus style development. They need to be able to expand in the same location as they feel their AI workloads are going to uh, really increase. Um, the uh, future proofing of the building is necessary. So, uh, what uh, you know, we thought we could create and, and would last for 15 years or, or 20 years, this that paradigm has shifted uh, in terms of floor loading, in terms of you know floor to ceiling heights, in terms of what the lifts can take. Again, 200 kilowatt max. That's an example. Um, and the other thing is, you know, the whole philosophy of plug and play because they don't really know when those work will come about and by what intensity. So, so trying to uh, preempt, speculate, buy that land, get that power, get the renewable energy. We're creating a large energy business within ESR just to uh, you know, fuel the data center demand, um, uh, both for our 400 rooftops across the region that we manage for, for our logistics business, but also terrestrial and, and offshore. Um, uh, so, so just combining all of that to bring a solution to somebody who needs it, whether it's an operator or a hyperscaler, I think that should be happening in the business. So, Stephen, where do the public sector sit in this dynamic? Are they sort of leading from the front and insisting on technological advancement? Yeah, well, the risk of being controversial, you have dynamic and public sector in the same sector. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the problem for, for me is um, governments are going to make a policy. Um, they don't even think about how they're going to uh, deliver that, uh, the action to deliver that uh, policy uh, and strategy. So, so the policies are there, but the action just really isn't. Um, and, and I think that's because nobody's accountable and nobody's responsible. It's too big an organisation. And uh, there's a lack of awareness around legacy IT infrastructure. A um, couple of interesting stats, 80% of the UK's public uh, in, uh, IT legacy infrastructure is in offices, office space or server rooms, uh, at a minimum of a PUE of four. Um, why haven't they moved it? Because the building doesn't land on one person's desk and it's oblivious to it. Um, and that's an example of what we have to grapple with, uh, coming back to sustainability. The government have set and legislated a, a net zero target, but they're not taking positive action to deliver with their own uh, NCIT. Uh, and a garden start, started by 2031, still 65% of their infrastructure will be legacy IT. So this is, this is a, a today problem that's going to cause an issue tomorrow um, and some of the Eastern Europe. Do you think added interest will we in the UK particularly bad, or do you think that's um, endemic of reflective of other public sector bodies across the world? Um, I, don't think, I don't think in the UK they were particularly bad. I think like, uh, a lot of other governments look to what the, uh, the UK is trying to do in terms of digital transformation. Maybe the CIT uh, challenge is not quite as complicated as the UK. Um, but generally, the UK is seen as leading the pack, which is quite worrying, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. So, Chester, I'm keen to get your views as a developer that's engaged in, in built suits and, and sort of large scale, hyper scale developments. Where you think um, leasing versus uh, self build versus build to suit factors in? Yeah, look, I, I think historically there's all, all, always been a move for both build to suit and for self build in the marketplace, but they serve two very different use cases. Um, and build to suit from a hypergate scale perspective, there's always been an always be operator. That will have the skills in order to procure the right planning and power in you know easy ease of tier one and tier two metrics in order to do that. And the hyperscalers don't have that ability necessarily more than they want that. And it's it's you know from the build to suit perspective.
perspective, that's going to be in, in less technically difficult locations um, where power is freely available. And the world we would say is a good example. Um, and where the deployment of, of CapEx is, is something that's only within their use cases from a, from a, from a company perspective. So I think over the next sort of decade, you know, there, there will be an opportunity for both you know, operators and developers to uh, grow with the growth of AI, with the growth of the hyperscale and migration um, onto the cloud that we're seeing from an enterprise perspective as well. And you know, there is a demand that really needs to be met. Uh, the operators and developers and data centers need that demand. The one thing that, that we're very good at is you know, efficient capital deployment. It's sort of um, assessing what the requirements of the hyperscalers will be um, in certain metros at different points in time, and being ready, waiting, and available to fulfill that demand when it comes. So we almost have to be very, you have to be very in touch with the market. Um, and I think that's where it's the speed to market, it's efficient capital allocation, it's the ability of experts in their field to get through the planning and permitting process, to procure the power and deal with the utility companies, to speculatively build where required, to have efficient allocation of capital, that the high risk don't, don't need that sort of hassle in their life to a large degree. We feel that need. From a self-building perspective, um, that usually, usually relates to uh, simpler jurisdictions that don't have those complexities. So I think over the next 10 years, with the advent of AI, with the advent of migration to cloud, there's going to continue to be that sort of parallel uh, uh, availability for both the least model, the builder suit, and the, the self-building. And I wanted to pick up on the point you made about the sort of funding models and the capital allocations. We've seen a wave of um, take privates and delistings right. in private equity. Yeah. Is the scale, is, is that fit for purpose for the scale of what needs to be delivered? Do you, do you see that as being a sort of long term structure or are we going to go back to? Yeah, I, I, I think the take privates that have happened over the last sort of in a couple of years. Yeah. Have been, have been very interesting for, for many different reasons. I suppose one, uh, when, a, when an organization is private, it's got more freedom you know, to do what it needs to do. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, behoven to the quarterly reports. It can take capital risks, right, in terms of what they're doing. Uh, they can land back or you know, land in power in jurisdictions that the markets may not be entirely happy with if they're a public company. And I think that's really important because it, it's important to be able to assess what the, what the market is doing, to take those risks calculated as they are, and to ensure, and, and you know, being the expert in the field, that that's an efficient use of capital and will pay off within the next 36 months. But that's no good if your, your share price drops because you've just deployed three, four hundred million in X, Y, Z, or A, right? Because, you know, your shareholders are not going to see the returns immediately. Right, so, so it gives greater freedom to organizations to do that, which may be one of the reasons why a lot of that has happened. And the data center operators and developers are here to serve the hyperscalers in the knowledge way. Right, and we have to be ready and able to do that. And we have to get there first into those jurisdictions where we see that growth happening before it even happens. Right, and that makes the hyperscalers decisions a lot easier in terms of leasing deployment if they already have that. Opportunity with somebody that they know that's able to deliver in a location that they might have fully deployed in. Right? Uh, we take the development risk, we take you know, uh, off the hand, uh, the capital risk to be uh, off the hands of the So that's one of the, you know, that, 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 that's one of the reasons why I think that the take privates has given a lot more flexibility to organizations. And the, the organizations that are, there are a few organizations uh, that are too big to take private, you know, they, they, will, they will stay like that. So, um, but I think for the industry, generally speaking, and for the growth of the industry, I actually think it's been a good thing. So, uh, but fundamentally, I think um, digital infrastructure should not sit in this technology at all. 
I mean, just because the uh, demand comes in such spurts uh, from the customer, from the business, and the demand may have so many different requirements in terms of the technology. Uh, like what you wonder it's in, in a quarter uh, in terms of spend and in terms of yield on cost will be completely different than the next quarter. So uh, and, and a listed company just doesn't have to give you a to deal with that. Uh, uh, in, I just say that's a very important point. Uh, it really is for many different reasons. Uh, you know, this is—it's it's never going to be your leasing profile is never going to be evenly based. You know, it, it, it's lonely. But over the medium term, it's very really, You know, its growth profile is very even, right? Um, but it's going to be lonely and to be known to the capital markets in that respect of the order is not something that lends itself onto well this industry. I suggest. So it's a So let, let's think about how we build and, and operate sustainably. Steve, you're, you're good on a, a controversial uh, opinion or two, but where do you think, what do you think we need to do and improve on to deliver responsibly? I think there's a couple of things it's easy to, uh, to complain about bias, but uh, I'll start a slightly different place before I do. Um, people, I, I, you know, we, we just, uh, we're a, a fast, one of the fastest growing sectors, yet yeah, not really investing in creating the workforce of tomorrow. Um, and in particular, a workforce that can design, build, and operate sustainable infrastructure uh, in a, a agile, dynamic, and innovative way. Um, and I'm not sure we're tied into the universities uh, and academia well enough either. So we have a lot of catching up to do there. And I think that. Correlates into the purchases. Um, a lot, a lot of my customers have never purchased a data centre. They wouldn't know what a sustainable or an unsustainable data centre look like if it's smacking across the face. Um, and people in the business have no idea about infrastructure either. It, it's it's kind of a little bit like a utility it works or it doesn't. Nobody cares when it works. When it doesn't work, the whole world drops around their ears. They don't really understand it, and therefore they can't ask the intelligent questions about improving and becoming more sustainable. So I think as an industry, we, we've got a lot of educating to do in the broadest term of creating that workforce to pull through, but also creating a more intelligent customer. Alex, do you, do you have a um, Yeah, I agree with, um, with Steve, obviously, we're well aligned. The other thing I wanted to bring an interesting statistic um, there's a lot of statistics about the um, industry and whether data centers are going to keep on expanding and growing. Uh, there's pros and cons, but um, I would invite everyone to go and download the latest um, uh, financial results for NVIDIA. Um, they're, they're predicting that in the next five years, the data center business is going to be growing by 53% tagalo, right? So NVIDIA five years ago didn't have a data center um, product. So right now they're at eleven billion dollars um, revenue, and by the end of uh, by twenty thirty they're going to be ten billion dollar business. So if you want to talk scale, um, they go from zero to one hundred ten billion in a matter of ten years. So all of that capacity is going to drop somehow. It doesn't matter why that or how it's dropping. Um, it's a real thing this year. So we need to do um, a number of things. Um, first of all, we need to make uh, data centers sexy. And, and what I mean by that, we need to uh, get young kids um, to understand what it is that we do, um, educate them, uh, explain to them, um, you know, why is it environment can work with. Um, second thing is that we need to stop designing with the snowflakes, um, bespoke, super complex um, um, kind of uh, buildings. Uh, and we need to basically build stuff that just works. Um, in 10 years' time, maybe in 5 years' time, we need to become a, a core utility. Uh, imagine uh, in 5 years' time when everything's going to be connected and now touching your local data center, not a big cloud, but your local number of data center, your lock to your door is not going to be working, your central heating is not going to be working, your car is not going to be going anywhere, your TV is not going to be doing anything, your phone is going to be a down thing. You won't be able to dial uh, major services because it's all um, voice over IP. So, um, data center security is going to be growing, it's going to become a more core part of our everyday lives, and, and we need to build faster, 
simplify it and stuff it. So, yes, uh, I'm only about dark environments, but even dark environments, we need a lot of people support around them. And we haven't been doing a very great job uh, so far. So, I think we're aware, well aware there are some structural impediments to delivering capacity in a time uh, and full stop. And I'm just interested to get views on where you see the biggest bottlenecks and how you're overcoming them. So, Dev, how, what, what is the biggest encumbrance you face? It's land scarcity, power? All of the above. <laughs> um, definitely finding the right land with the amount of power that you need uh, to, to build in a uh, floor area ratio that is available for you on that land. Especially in the Asian context where land is very, very expensive and, and you know you get really tiny parcels and not really build vertical. Um, one of the data centers we operate is 13 floors. Um, <laughs> this is a problem would be unheard of. Um, so so uh, getting customers acclimatized to the fact that this is what they will get in Asia in the Asian context is a big deal. Um, uh, getting renewable energy. Uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges is everybody talks ESG, but uh, we don't see governments having sufficient policy where you generate at point A and then consume at point B, and you have a, a connection which is virtual, right? You, you, there's no direct line uh, joining the two, uh, but it's spread through the grid and off taken somewhere else. Uh, policy uh, towards that. I think that's a big challenge. So, yeah, it's, it's both on the industry side as well as on the development side. Um, so, in, a, in emerging markets, there's a lot of talk about democratization of the cloud, and there's, it's clearly in, in Asia Pacific, to come back to you, more underdeveloped. Are there, are there markets that you look at and, and think we're just not going to be able to, to enter into them, or is it a sort of a step-by-step -step approach? Um, so we're in uh, seven, eight markets right now. The aspiration uh, to be diversified and to provide scale to customers is to be in 13 countries across Asia Pacific, especially the higher countries where they would definitely not go themselves so then they need help in hand. And we would have a development business already on the logistics side. So, so it is more uh, programmatic, more sort of stepped approach, but um, I mean, Structural reasons, ownership reasons. Um, you know, Malaysia has its own philosophy on, on how structures need to exist. Philippines has its own, and they're not always easy. Um, many currencies in Asia are non-convertible. So, uh, if you charge in local currency, there's no way to convert to dollars. Um, uh, and you cannot upstream the cash flow, irrespective of how much money the asset is generating. It has to stay onshore. Uh, so there are cash flow issues. Um, uh, and that's why we don't see the amount of development in Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia. Um, it's incongruent with the amount of uh, with the, the population and the amount of data that is getting generated in those countries. Um, those are some of the most, not just densely populated, but per capita usage of data that are the highest because they, they completely uh, miss the telephone uh, era, right? They went from nothing to mobile phones. And, Okay, I will be warned on the time limit, so it must be time to try and get a few questions from the audience. Anyone with a question they would like to ask our panel? Don't be shy. Yes, please. Uh, I have a question for you guys. You were talking about the individual. Did you estimate what kind of power requirement? So I think um, the estimation right now we're running about 100 kW blocks in media with the latest design. Um, there is um, speculation now something to 200 to 300. Um, the, the, the numbers are just almost unbelievable right now. Um, and, but this is where the workloads um, they are going to end up. And they don't make a specific mention to that. Also, it's a bit of a, a tricky subject. Because data centers have been seen as the um, energy dazzlers in any community, so um, but, yeah, uh, we
within three to five years, we're going to be at the 100 KW rocks for specific environments and specific purposes. Uh, the question was more, you talked about the, the forecast, the road forecast, the energy status, the business. How would you translate that into make a lot of positive requirements for the industry? Um, so, um, from a footprint point of view? Yeah. Okay, so imagine that the 10 megawatt data center right now um, is going to occupy this, uh, the, a 50 megawatt data center, an AI 50 megawatt data center is going to be occupied by the same space as 10 megawatt data center right now. And then in three to five years' time, that's going to double. So 100 meg in the footprint of the 10 meg data center. There's a lot of challenges that come in that. And then, you know, much power rate, how do you um, sort of the cooling issues, um, but that's kind of the comparison, right? So the, the real estate footprint of, of, of 10 megawatts is going to be producing 50 megawatts of workloads. Was that the? Yeah, I think you can do that on the center. You mentioned that they're going to 100 million in Oh yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's uh, gigawatts. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, there's no, sorry, apologies for your question. So yeah, it's like multiple gigawatts, like, you know, six, seven, eight gigawatts of, of data center capacity. That's what means it's, it's almost like the numbers are so crazy, it doesn't matter these things are going to run in the globe somewhere, and if it's two in Europe, two in Asia, two in America, it almost irrelevant, right? I mean, us as a global data center players, we have a big um, road to climb ahead of us, and um, you know we won't be doing it in the same way we did in our own change. Uh, I mean, I wonder how many countries have 400 kV alliances of oil in the world. So I can answer two. Two, no many. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, I want to nip in and, and round out with one final, sort of quick fire question to each of the, the panelists. So, if, if we can leave the audience with maybe uh, your views on one maybe wildcard factor which might have a disproportionate impact on on the industry moving forward, which perhaps people aren't thinking about, um, good or bad. What, what do you think that would be? Um, so my view would be to eliminate waste. Um, eliminate waste in building um, infrastructure, right? Whether it's you know energy construction, just eliminate waste. So every single thing needs to count. So that's the one thing I think we need to concentrate. I would say we underestimate uh, the power of green hydrogen on site. I think there's a lot going on there. And, and within three to five years, these workloads I think can be managed or hopefully will be managed uh, without it. I still don't think sustainability is taken seriously enough. It will change when the end customer forces uh, the all purchases.